right, I'm here with Sam Weaver, running for city council in Boulder, Colorado. How's the uh, campaign going? It's going great so far. So we hear a lot of good things. Pretty excited about you, um, just to be up front. Um, what issues are you particularly passionate about? So the tagline for my campaign is healthy business, clean energy, sustainable boulder. I know, and all so, the words I love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, a lot of it's about innovation. You know, business uh -huh. in Boulder is 85% small businesses. You know, 85% of the people are employed by small businesses. And Is that I, unusual or is that... No, I don't think it's particularly unusual but in Boulder you know a lot of those small businesses are based around technology or uh -huh. natural foods uh -huh. you know really kind of creative time types of subjects and I think it's you know we we're voted number one in the country for startups um, and I think that's something that we just want to preserve and what we've had going right so far we want to keep going right and I think we want to be able to collaborate with our businesses to be healthy in two ways economically vibrant but also environmentally healthy. So both of right. those are, are really important. So I look forward to working with the business community uh -huh. on how to recycle. You know, 17% of the business waste in Boulder is recycled, and I think we can do better than that. Um, hmm. <clears throat> my business recycles, and so... What's and, your business? Uh, my business is Cool Energy. We're a five-person company here in Boulder. We've been cool. around about seven years, and we're working on heat recovery systems to huh. improve energy efficiency in commercial processes like coffee roasting. Uh -huh. So you take the heat that's going out the exhaust stack right. of a building and you turn it into electricity for no extra energy. Wow. Yeah, my good friends just opened Boxcar, which I'm sure you know. Boxcar and Cured, they roast coffee anyway, cool. down on Pearl Street. <clears throat> nice. I'm sure they'd love that. Um, yeah, so it sounds like you're actually, um, you know, walking the talk of those good buzzwords with, you know, sustainable business and all that. Yeah, I mean, we compost and we recycle, and I like um, companies that do that. Like you go into Snarf's sandwich shop and you uh -huh. see that they're all about composting and reusing. They've got, you know, uh, yeah. non-disposable washable cups for people who are going to stay and eat there. And and the cups that they do have to go are compostable cups. So, you uh -huh. know, I love businesses in Boulder who are already on it, and I want to see what we can do to get kind of everybody on board. Love it. Yeah, so a lot of people... Uh, talk about you know business and um, environmental concerns um, or our wonderful environmental uh, you know beauty our outdoors um, working together and businesses wanting to be here because Boulder is so beautiful and has a great community mm -hmm. but it seems like historically there's always this tension between the business community and um, you know the environmentalists uh, how, how would you resolve that and actually have them work together well, I think talking is the place to start. <clears throat> so with the eco-cycle um, push for more businesses to recycle, I think the way to start that conversation is to learn from the businesses what the barriers are. Places like Snarfs or my company, we've gotten through those barriers somehow. So yeah. to go learn from the businesses that don't do it, what is keeping them from being able to do it? And if it's something like cost, then to make sure that they know what the real costs really are. You know, it's not clear to me that when people think, oh, that's just one more thing I have to do. Well, right. once you start doing it, it's just what you do every day. And it's not as challenging as you might think the first time you have to do it. So there's some, some structural issues. You know, people who lease their spaces and the landlord is the one that's providing the trash service and they can't really have an influence over that, then the conversation needs to be with the landlord, not with the actual mm. business owner themselves. And so kind of putting those things in buckets, find where it's the business owner, where it's the landlord, and get the conversation going. I mean, at the end of the day, like I said it at the forum the other night, uh, regulation is a tool in the city's toolbox, but it's not where you want to start. You'd like to get as far as you can without having to pass a measure or sure. or require it. So, you know. Well, we liberals, I mean, speaking personally, we like to pass laws about everything, right? Right. So, 
That would be the other way to go. You well, just make laws everywhere. That's right. And and it's got to be a blend, right? Yeah. You don't want laws where they're not needed, so you don't right. want to pass rules that aren't solving a problem. Yeah. I think uh, EcoCycles demonstrated that this is a problem um, uh-huh. in the business community, and we need to go find out where it is. Another example of businesses playing in the community and doing their part is going to be around commercial energy codes. So we first saw this with the residential energy codes that were put in that required that buildings that were <clears throat> rental buildings be brought up to certain energy standards over time. And that process I think went pretty well. Yeah. Really engaged the city helped the them city do it. yeah really engaged the um the building owners and yeah. let them, you know, heard their concerns, incorporated those in the program, had a nice yeah. long phase in period, like five years or so. And with commercial, it's even more complicated and diverse. And so I think a long time is going to need to be put into understanding, like my landlord at one of my buildings has done a great job of stuff like he's got solar panels on the roof, right? And so his concern, which I think is legitimate, is he doesn't want to start from a baseline that's already higher energy efficiency and then he just has to go put more money in and become even more energy efficient. So we have to make sure that we have kind of standards of building performance and those are applied equally to everybody and if people are already ahead of the game then maybe they don't have to do anything. Right. You know, so landlords who have been really good at getting ahead of the the curve because they thought it was the right thing to do shouldn't be penalized by this. But at the same time, you know, there's our carbon commitment, the climate commitment that the city is adopting <clears throat> is 80% below 1990 emissions levels by 2050. And by 2050? By 2050. <clears throat> uh, but wow. we're taking the first step towards getting there with our building energy codes. And so the planning board, I sit on the planning board, and we recommended approval to council of the new energy efficiency codes for buildings and we're adopting the 2013 international energy codes but we're going 30 percent beyond that and so we're all new buildings are going to have to be 30 percent better than the 2012 iecc codes that's the first step on the path to net zero buildings the building it's um, exciting yeah it is really exciting i mean boulder did something that almost nobody saw it adopted these uh, energy codes that have an explicit goal by 2037, all new buildings are net zero. They all produce as much energy or more than they consume. This is a super exciting goal for the city. And, you know, the extra cost for this 30% better than 2012 is about 2% for new buildings. Wow. So it's really, you know, Boulder's pushing the envelope, but it's huh. balancing the cost-benefit really nicely. Huh. So that's where a lot of my focus is, is around energy issues and around how... We can get there without harming businesses or our environmental, li- I mean, our economic and environmental vibrancy. Right, and obviously, hopefully, helping. Right, know. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, what other issues are you passionate about that um, maybe are somewhat different than the other council candidates? Well, let's see. Um, I'm really concerned with how we're uh, handling the homeless problem in Boulder, because it's got a lot What is of, the problem? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. Is people yeah. talk about the homeless issue or the homeless problem, and it's really a bunch of different things kind of right. all packed into one. So we've got people who have had a life event of some kind that's knocked them off their track. You sure. know, something that happened like a medical event, a divorce, <clears throat> um, getting laid off in a bad economy. So there's a group of people that don't have a place to stay or having to stay in the shelters or sleep outdoors who would really like to get beyond that stage of their life. They'd like to move into a job, be able to get into a house, and they just need some help in being able to do that. And I think of those as, you know, folks who this is a temporary condition for. Then there's another population, a subset of people who aren't um, sheltered who are mentally challenged. They've got some kind of of, uh, condition that's making it difficult for them to even know what to do next, necessarily. And for them, navigating the maze of government programs that might be able to help them out is really difficult. The other subpopulation that there is are people who have made, for one reason or another, a lifestyle choice, and for whom this isn't a a, uh, temporary condition. Right. And so how do we look at 
these different populations. So like those the three groups, basically. Yeah, that's the okay. way I think of them. Okay. I mean, it's probably even more complicated. Oh, no, sure, than that. of course. Yeah. So, I think those three groups need different kinds of services and treatment, and yeah. one group needs an opportunity to get a job. And so the ready to work program that's being run out of the bridge house has two different types of jobs. There's landscaping where they put people on crews and they do work around the city. That company gets paid and they get a paycheck. So the homeless there would get a paycheck. The homeless there right. in the ready to work program. So you have to qualify for it and you have to you know interview for it. And then if you get put into it, you have to show up for work. Right. And it's just like any job. You can end up being let go sure. if you're not doing the, the commitment but if thing. you're motivated there's a job for you if you're motivated there's a job for you and so the bridge house also serves lunch every day out of the carriage house downtown and the um, other uh, job opportunity that they just opened up is commercial kitchen so over on Arapahoe near 55th Street is a brand new commercial kitchen and an anonymous donor um, gave the money to create this really state of the art commercial kitchen because there's a lot of food service jobs in Boulder and so they, another group of people who go into the ready to work program end up at this commercial kitchen, prepping the food that the homeless are served at lunch in the uh, carriage house. And right. so this is a really nice um, way to get people into work. And, and these programs, I believe, are six months long. And when you graduate from the program, at least you've got skills that are valuable in the community. You can apply to a landscaping company or to one of the restaurants in town and right. get a job. So I think the the need that the Bridge House expresses on that path, you know, the hand up path to get people out of the, the rut they may be stuck in, is more housing. And so we'll see how the new housing in North Boulder works out. Does it really serve the purpose of the people in this transition? Or do we need a dorm style of housing where people can have their own room? It's, you, it's a place you'll only be for six months. Uh-huh. while you're in the ready to work program and it's modeled after some of the stuff that Isabel McDevitt saw when she was in New York City mm-hmm. doing work with the homeless. <clears throat> so one of my focuses on council is going to be to make sure that we put the um, puzzle pieces in place so that people who do want to get out of a bad situation have a path to do so. That's great. Um, <clears throat> the mental health issues involved making sure that those folks get in front of the service organizations that can help them out. Yeah. And the city's role in that, I believe, is really just a coordination role. It's not a huge just amount of money. Them. It's connecting the people who need the services to the government agencies, either county or federal, that can help provide those services. But then that brings us to another challenge. And the challenge is the behaviors that we've been seeing some on the municipal campus, on the lawn that's near yeah. where the um, uh, farmer's market is. And there's a lot of women in particular in this community that are scared to be in those areas at night. And that's something that I don't think is really okay. Um, You know, I don't think anybody in Boulder should really be fearing for their safety. We live in a pretty well-to-do town and we should be able to make sure that people feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so a beginning uh, piece of that puzzle is to add some lights down in the area so at nighttime people um, don't feel um, like there's a chance that somebody can come at them from a place of darkness. But then also maybe we need to look at programming public spaces a little bit so that no single group has a de facto occupation of a space. So that anybody who wants to use the municipal <clears throat> lawn or the, the other lawn may have an opportunity to do so as an organized group. Yeah. And I think it's something that we need. I mean, th- these are just ideas. I think they need exploration. Sure. I'm not proposing any, any solutions at this point. But, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who have been thinking about this Yeah, who have ideas. <clears throat> right. Yeah. But I think it's something that, you know, part of uh, what people propose is more police. And I'm behind, you know, adding a few um, police to the force. But I think it goes beyond just policing and enforcement yeah. and goes on to how we think about our public spaces and how much concern we have for the feeling of safety of people in the public spaces. Well, the one thing I would say with the police is, uh, you know, the heavy handed, like the solution ultimately isn't going to be heavy handed. It's going to be kind of tactical or something like mm-hmm. if there's more police on bikes, on the bike paths and like mm-hmm. really getting to know the homeless and, you know, that could be helpful. Um, 
and I personally like I bike around on the bike paths all the time and there's huge stretches with no lights where mm-hmm. I always think it's right. a you know I'm six foot three and I weigh almost 200 pounds I always think I would not feel safe right now even on a bike at night with um, no lights in the stretch if I were a woman or right you know. right one of the good ideas I've heard um, from another of the city council candidates about that is to have motion activated lights in a lot of places That's because great. you don't need to have them on all the time if sure. everybody's coming by sure. um, but if, if there are places like that I agree I think that that the combination of different programming looking at how our lighting and our safety is done yeah. maybe you even want some more phones you know along the path where if yeah. something does happen people can get to those quickly yeah so. or just a lot of you know cops on bikes on yeah. the on the bike path it'd be great I almost never see them on there and whenever I do see a, a police officer on a bike it's you know it's wonderful it's like that Norman Rockwell feeling because they're like out of the car in touch with the community getting to know that's right I love that that's right. um, and they've had studies that that kind of thing is super, super effective like you know police officers on horses whatever it is yeah there's another aspect of this that doesn't get talked out of, uh, about a lot <clears throat> and that's what's happening when these cases get into municipal court. So right. when there are citations written, are those citations being followed through on? Right. You know, are we having appropriate consequences for misbehavior? And that's right. something else that I'll want to look into more closely. Again, I'm not coming in proposing solutions. Sure. It's just sure. an area that I'm going to think about that's outside of my, for me, renewable energy and carbon emissions reductions, my top of the list. But as I've gotten deeper into the campaign and gotten to know some of the broader issues in the community, the, the social services have become really interesting to me. Great. And then the other piece is open space. Mm. And open space is <clears throat> a treasure. So the, what about that? Well, the flood repair yeah. is really at the top of my list. I mean, I think that um, open space trails have seen a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. And our community loves its open space and loves to access open space. <clears throat> and so right front and center is getting the trail repairs done right. But right is a balance between getting done fast and getting done in a way that will be more resilient to the next flood event that we have. Right. Because you could just put the trails back where they were, <clears throat> and fill in the gullies, but those gullies are gonna come back the next time we have a big rain event or a flood. Yeah. And so what's the right balance to be struck between getting the community back on the trails that it loves but making the trails better because of what we've learned because of the, the flood events. Yeah. So that's an area I think Mike Patton, who's the head of um, Open Space and Mountain Parks, does a really good job. Cool. Um, and I think we need to make sure that he has access to the funding he needs, yeah. whether it's coming from reserves in Open Space and Mountain Parks or maybe other city reserves that you could transfer now and then get built back up later so that yeah. we can get the... I would give that guy the money he needs you know, to do it long term. Because right. I use a lot of trails that, you know, there's now, like, rivers through where there were trails. Right. And if you just put the trail back, it'll just get wiped out again. That's right. <clears throat> Which so. puts us back in the same space yeah. next time. Yeah. But if we can do a good job this time, then maybe yeah. next time that one doesn't get wiped out. Right. So th- that about open space, I also look forward to um, there's been some acquisitions in the northern part mm-hmm. of the open space system and being able to connect... Um, the Boulder Reservoir Trail System all the way up to uh, Heil Ranch huh. is something that I think can happen over the next four to six years. And um, cool. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the details of that and to advocating, you know, that we get a balance of uses in those spaces and that everybody be able to enjoy that connection. So a little more access? Yeah, maybe? I mean... I know that's a ba- tough word. It's, it's a tough word, balanced yeah. access. Yeah. You know, I think... For, for places like that, you want to make sure that every user group gets an opportunity to enjoy those spaces. And I think up front is the time to have those conversations. So I'm sure that Mike will be bringing forward some kind of trail study mm-hmm. as, as the um, time comes near. And so bringing new ideas to that, I really like the way that Batasso um, up in the county. I used yeah. to live on Sugarloaf. I was a firefighter and fire chief up oh, right. on Sugarloaf That's for a right. while. And, um, you know, there was busy a guy. That was it's a busy it, role. It was, it was very rewarding, actually. Yeah. I really liked being able to help the community in that very tactile way. You know, firefighting is really tactile in the sense that you're there kind of on the ground. And When's our next interview? In 20 minutes. Okay. 
we're over time, but do you mind going for a few minutes? Oh, I don't mind. Huh? So can I jump into fire a Please, little bit? Sure. So as I grew up here in Boulder and uh, until the flood, I felt like we were relatively secure from almost, you know, like terrorism, whatever would happen. This is a very stable, safe community. Fire mm -hmm. is one thing that's only getting worse with climate change and the smoke we're seeing continually, which is really scary, even from Wyoming or wherever it's from. Mm -hmm. So what what would you do to you know, maybe work in a more regional or even multi-state way in terms of around fires and local? So um, I'd start with the local issues. Yeah. I mean, I'm really interested in talking about climate resiliency in Boulder. Uh -huh. And that means two things. That means floods and fires, really. Um, we have to be prepared for more flooding events. We have to be prepared for more drought, which seems counterintuitive, but yeah. it's the way it works. And that drought is what leads to these fire events that go all the way into the winter. And so one of the things I think we're going to need to look at, and the conversation kind of has gotten started, is on our western border. What are we going to do to mitigate, say, homes? You know, the, the wildland urban interface. So up on Sugarloaf, this was obviously a perennial challenge. We were always trying to educate homeowners on what they could do to make their home more firewise, as we called it at the time. And I think there's going to need to be more of that in the city of Boulder, particularly in the western edges, you know, the, the two or three rows of houses that are actually on the border of the city. Probably the city is going to need to work with them, those homeowners to make it harder for fire to get into the city because yeah. we don't want, you know, when these flame fronts come and you've got multiple homes on fire at once, you really challenge your emergency responders. So, you know, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So... Yeah. So um, I read this study, uh, it was in the New York Times a few years ago, about how running in Manhattan, like jogging daily, was actually worse for your health than not jogging because the air quality was huh. so bad. Uh -huh. um, and air quality is just something I think about generally when, you're, when I bike every day and when I'm biking around and, you know, it's smoggy like all summer. That's right. You know, from the fires. That, no, I mean, that's a really big deal. And, yeah, and you it's know, new. Like, I don't really remember that on an ongoing basis. I don't back. either. Yeah. I've been here only 24 years compared to you've been That's here. That's a long time. Yeah. Well, I left for a while. <laughs> okay. Um, but no, it's definitely, I've seen more of it as well. Yeah. Um, I've been in Boulder five years, and uh, but I've worked here most of the sure. time that I've, I've been in the area. And I can't ever remember ash falling in Boulder yeah. until we had the Four Mile Fire. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was just a, a steady stream of ash for yeah. some number of hours, and yeah. that was really bad. Yeah. Um, and then maybe touching on a couple other issues um, in short order, uh, municipalization. Um, it's a huge supporter. I mean, I, I worked with the um, group that's now called Empower Our Future. Back then it was Renewables Yes and the Boulder Clean Energy Business Coalition to do a citizens modeling effort. Because in 2011, the city was mostly modeling grid power, you know, the same kind of mix of natural gas and coal, and the citizens were pushing for more renewables. So right. I worked with a, a team of about 12 of us who put together a way to model hour by hour how much renewables can be on the grid in this hour to serve Boulder's load, mm -hmm. and how much backup of fossil fuels do you need to do that, what are the costs going to be. And we, we presented this, our results in 2011 alongside the cities to say, look, the city can show cost parity with fossils, but we can show cost parity with 50% renewables right away, wow. and 60% emissions reduction. And so I was really engaged at that point. I debated Excel eight times. I was pro municipalization. So 60% uh, emissions reduction. Correct. At cost parity. At cost parity. And do, does anyone else back up those numbers? Yeah, the city's later studies, okay. what they've done since 2011. So have, have, have reinforced have that. Have reinforced that. Oh, the city's. The city has done a fabulous job. And that's been third party. It's been third party. Yeah. The third party reviewer gave us an A plus yeah. for having done that really That's amazing. 60% really well. cost parity. Yeah, that's because kind of wind no, is That's no brainer territory. Yeah. So the reason that Excel is buying wind right now is yeah. because it's a good deal. The right. CEO of Excel was bragging that the wind that they're buying is 2.9 cents per kilowatt hour. Sure. which means that they should be doing absolutely as much of it as they can and turn off their coal plants. And it's because they're not going to do that. It's because they're hitched to coal for the next 60 years that we need to stand on our own. Because of their investments in the plants? Yes. <clears throat> the Comanche 3 plant is going to run through 2069. 
They are putting money into two other plants, Pawnee and Hayden, to keep them running for another 10 and 20 years. They're upgrading their emissions controls, but they're not doing anything to stop the carbon dioxide emissions. That's just SOX and NOx emissions. So, so yeah. So why don't they look at those parity numbers, you know, the study like you and others have done, and say, oh, we could go this direction for equal costs and not reinvest in our coal plants? Because they've already made those investments. And so for them, it's yeah. a sunk cost. It's an asset that they're making 10% on. Right. And so every time that the Public Utilities Commission well, let's them put another plant in the ground that's going to last. They let them make 10% a year off of that investment, which is an amazing return if you think about it. Where can you go and get a practically guaranteed 10% return on your investment? It's hard to find. They take $35 million a year out of Boulder yeah. in pre-tax profits. And to me, from a business standpoint, I think a muni would do better. Typical mu municipal utilities are 15% less than investor-owned utilities, and they're usually about twice as reliable. But, you know, in Excel's defense, they're now putting 300000 of that back into our local advertising uh, economy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, uh, and what other issues have I not touched on? So many. Transportation? Transportation's a big one. And um, I won't try and unpack all of transportation. I'm a big supporter sure. of alternative transportation. Biking, of course, we want to continue to improve. Do you bike yourself? I do bike. A couple mm -hmm. days a week, I go to right, work on my bike. And I try and never take a car downtown. So I live in the Whittier and Everson. Any trips that oh, get cool. made into the downtown area are all by bike. So yeah, that's where I grew up, around there. Cool, cool. So, but, but transportation's really tied with land use. Mm -hmm. And so land use and how we're going to have where our city centers are and where the denser populations are and how those get interconnected either by bike or by bus, that takes a lot of care to think about. You know, one of the things that I don't have any suggestions about, but I think the community needs to talk about, is the fact that at build out with our current zoning, we would have 60,000 more jobs in Boulder than we have now, 20,000 more residents. And you do the numbers on that, and it looks like about 100,000 in commuters every day, whereas we have about 50,000, 55,000 right now. And so what? So doubling the traffic. Yeah, at, at build out, if we get there. <clears throat> Um, the city staff doesn't project. They project another roughly 15,000 jobs and 15,000 people uh -huh. over the next 20 years. But that's not what the zoning says. That's just what they think the builders will do with the zoning. So a conversation that, and a process that I think we need to have uh -huh. is, is that the city we want? <clears throat> and if it's not, how do we change some of that zoning to get us the city we want? And in that discussion, you have to talk about transportation. Right, so if we're gonna have different zoning and more dense population centers, maybe in the East County, um, and in the North and South, I said County, I mean in the Eastern part of the city, in the North and South yeah. part have some city centers. If you're gonna do that, then how do you connect those up in ways that are easy for people to bike, walk, bus on? Yeah, so in terms of bicycling, which is obviously something uh, people of any uh, economic background can do easily, um, it's great for kids, it's great for health, you know, it's great for everything. How would you encourage more bicycling? Well, one of the key ways is separated bike lanes. <clears throat> so there's a pilot going on, I'm not really sure that it's big enough, but over on baseline, uh -huh. for about a mile on either side of baseline, they've got these separated bike lanes that are separated by those yeah. um, parking yeah. blocks. Mary was just talking about those. Yeah, and I think we should run some real pilots that connect maybe multiple miles along some major corridors. And we should really assess, does it improve the number of bikers on those? Because I would expect it would. Um, if it's connected. If, if it's if not it, connected, correct. it's almost useless, I would say. Th that's right. And the baseline one, to me, it looks more like a uh, kind of a feasibility test. Right, it's sense. a trial. It's just a trial, yeah. but it doesn't go far enough that yeah. you can assess what the impacts will be. So separated lanes is one thing. Um, I think that in North Boulder, we're going to need to look at the results of the flooding to see if our floodways you know, in North Boulder are good enough and any place that we need additional floodways um, might be another opportunity for connector trails up there. Because uh -huh. um, North Boulder on the Four Mile Creek Trail and then uh, Central Boulder on the Gregory Canyon uh, drainages, those both had some pretty high impacts oh, on yeah. the homes there. Yeah, my house drowned in Gregory Canyon water. Wow. So, um, and then maybe a final point, affordable housing and generally just, uh, you know, diversity of uh, income, you know, classes. How do we make Boulder um, or keep Boulder accessible? 
So I think affordable housing is, is the way we do that, <clears throat> and that has a couple different flavors. Um, we are targeted at 10% affordable housing stock, and we're at about 8 and so we need to continue the progress of getting at least to our goal of 10% of the units in Boulder being affordable. But the other... Why are we lower at all? Well, we've just started this program, what, 10 years ago, okay. where we set a 10% goal, and we've actually been going I towards see. that 10% goal. We just so haven't good. reached it yet. Yeah, now the trend lines are all in the right direction for that. Um, the other thing I think about is densifying neighborhoods that exist. So in Whittier, where I live, I live in one of four residences on two lots. And so over time, the east end of Whittier in the 80s and 90s really densified. You had three plexes and four plexes go in behind homes. And I expect at the time, the, the uh, lot owners were allowed to subdivide and make money. Uh -huh. So we can talk with the neighborhoods and see who's receptive. Perhaps in Martin Acres, you could allow a different zoning where, first, first of all, there's OAUs, owner accessory units, and ADUs, accessory dwelling units. There's some limits on those. I think we should revisit those and maybe open that up a little bit. But also look at doing densification in neighborhoods where the, the owners, the property owners, are interested in it. And that densification may get you a neighborhood that looks like Whittier, which I think is a pretty good place to live. It's not lots of tall buildings. It's not density that looks like huge apartment buildings. It's density that looks like a few more homes next to each other. Sure. And can be a very pleasant place to walk. Yeah. And like Mary was saying, you know, can help the homeowners afford to right. pay their mortgage and all right. that. Right. Um, I think we're well over time. But okay. Sam, thank you so much. It's great. Yeah. Good interview. It's a pleasure.